Dr. Hi. C. How are you? Good. Great to see you. Can you hear me all right? Yep. No problem. Wow. Hi. Where are you? I'm in like, the Renewable Energy Lab at Stanford. So this oh. is normally where I teach my building science class from. So I figured uh -huh. it's, a nice, wow. it's a nice quiet space. So yeah, a lot, a lot going on in the back, background yeah. here. That's exciting. So are you guys, are you all still, uh, are you still all remote then? Or are you kind of No, hybrid? we're in person, except that I got my vaccine yesterday and I felt like crap today. Oh. So I've been home all day. I just had asynchronous classes and I figured I can muster up 45 minutes to be with you in this class. I didn't want to, I kind of made that appointment a long time ago and I just wasn't even thinking and putting two and two together that usually people feel like crap on the second dose. So um, I got it yesterday afternoon and I'm still, I just have a terrible headache. Uh. So that's why I'm kind of like, didn't, you know, I look kind of raunchy and I'm just sort of like sitting at home, but my students have been, actually, I can see Hadley's got her mask on. So she's must be at school. Yeah. Yeah. I, told I am the option of being wherever they wanted. So you, where are you in the college counseling area? Yeah. I'm in the college counseling area by myself. So I could take it off, I guess, but no, I better leave it on just in yeah. case somebody walks in. So <laughs> there well, are 10 well, people in the class. Okay. Um, like I, I mentioned in the email, it's, I started this class about maybe five years ago. Uh, I had an independent study student that was interested in, you know, doing whatever he didn't really care. He wanted to do something. And then I got an email kind of out of the blue from a student or a, a, a dad of a student who graduated from LFA, um, Holly West. I don't know if she. Oh overlapped. yeah, she was the year before me. Yeah, her oh, yeah. dad. Her dad was one of the. He. I think he was. He was on the executive board of Kraft. Yes, exactly. He exactly. He worked at Kraft, and he was a big wig there, and and a scientist. And so he um, approached me and said that Kraft was interested in doing some kind of a project with high school kids. Oh. And so he said, do you have anybody that might want to do something? And I said, as a matter of fact, I do. And so it started for the first couple of years with Kraft and they kind of funded us and they um, had um, special projects, specific projects that they wanted us to do like the anthocyan or the antioxidants that I mentioned and the, you know, extracting the color because they stopped using like yellow dye number five for food coloring for um, mac and cheese. They now use turmeric, which was one of the wow. projects that one of the people I was, one of my students was working on. So, um, but then they, once Kraft joined with um, uh, Heinz, like the ketchup, mm -hmm. then Heinz was like, why are you spending, you know, $2,000, all that money on this high school when we could just be having that, give, give that money to our executives or whatever. <laughs> and so they dropped us. <laughs> and so, but the, the upside of it is then that gave me more freedom in the kinds of projects, but then I have to find my own funding. So, which I, I've gotten a couple of small grants for, for like $2,500. But, you know, so now I have kind of projects I'm more interested in, like, you could probably tell, like, sustainable things like um, bioplastics out of seaweed and, and um, trying to upcycle material, like you probably read in the thing I said. So this group has been working hard, and it's been hard because we were on remote six weeks total since, the, since August, where we had to go remote, and, you know, they, I sent them home with supplies and it you know oh. it's a little bit harder than you know you would expect but and last year's class you know we left in march abruptly and then that was the end of that so so but they're doing their best and um we've been also reading drawdown like i mentioned in one of my emails that that was something i thought would be good to do while we were remote because you know we you know we can only do so much from home and um so we started reading that book and we've gone through the first, I mean, we haven't read, it, read every single section because there's so many sections. So what, what we do is I, 
I just send them a Google form and they pick out their top, you know, four or five subjects and then we, you know, narrow it down. And then those are the ones that we discuss and they just sort of do it Harkness style. If you remember Harkness from English class, probably oh you did that gosh, back in yeah. the day. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's, that's pretty much what we've been doing. And um, so we're, we ha kind of have an interest, or at least I do, and I've been making them have the same interest in you know, environmental and sustainability and stuff like that. We're trying to reduce our, you know, single use plastic and things like that. So, which of course is like the worst time now because everything is single use plastic yeah. in the cafeteria and, you know, all this ordering out and all this kind of stuff. So that's kind of a downside. I know that the air- Wait, is Dr. C? But oh, hi. Hey, I just want to see how you're feeling. Um, I'm good enough to have a 45 minute class, but I have a terrible headache still and- just super tired, but I can't sleep because I'm so sore and achy. So, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so glad. That's what um, Mr. Rogan was the same way. He said it came on bad this morning. So yeah. I just want, I just saw you on, so I wanted to say hi. Oh, yeah. um, just text me later and let me know how it's going. Okay. Okay. I'm assuming I'm going to be better by tomorrow. I better. I'm going to be mad if I'm not. So. <laughs> All right. I'll let All you get back. Thank Thanks, you. kiddo. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'm glad I can just have you uh, sit back and relax and listen to me and take a uh, take a load off today. Okay, wait, before you begin, uh, Miss Kiso, which of course she said hello, by the way. Oh, yes, tell her say hello back. Yes, um, she wants me to take a picture, a screenshot of everybody. Three, six, nine, ten. Everybody's here. Ian, I can't really see your face. Can you get like you know? And now, obviously, it's hard to say cheese, but. Um, do the best you can on, on three. Ready? One, two, three. All right. There it is. <laughs> I will send that to her. Okay. I'm going to give you, obviously, the right to share your screen. And then thank you so much for being here. And if the kids have a question, should they wait or can they just jump in or how, how do you want that? Yeah, to just, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, if you Do you guys know the raise hand feature? Um, Oh yeah. Use that. Yeah. I just just uh, do, do that and I'll, I'll see you. Okay. Um, so I've te I've been, uh, can you see my screen? All right. Yeah. It looks title? perfect. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm used to, I'm used to zoom teaching this, uh, teaching class here at Stanford. So wow. I've got it. And I usually have a couple of TAs to, to help me out with the, the chat or, or anything, but, um, nice. yeah, I'm excited to, uh, gosh, the first time coming back, I've been meaning to come back to LFA for, several years at least I can do it easily now seeing from uh from Stanford but um gosh yeah so it's uh so I'm excited to talk to you guys all today um my talk's titled from the inner city to the remote arctic lessons in fighting climate change from an LFA alum and so I was Dr. C's AP chem student from uh 2008 to 2009 um gosh I feel so so long ago but uh you guys are really lucky to have Dr. C as a as a teacher and I mean I still mem remember all, a lot of moments from science classes and in high school that inspired me to get to where I am today so I'll, I'll sneak in a few little tidbits um, of advice and everything and and I swear Dr. C hasn't told me to say anything or any of these you know tidbits just come from the come from the heart um, I'll get into you know some of my personal background in a bit but I just want to start off with a, you know, a little short story with my <clears throat> perspective with climate change. So after college, I knew I wanted to study and go into a you know job fighting climate change at something, but I was kind of confused on where to go. So usually when I'm confused, I go out to nature, take a deep breath, you know, walk around. In this case, I took it a little bit farther and I drove up to Alaska with a friend. And there I was exploring, you know, some pretty remote spots and I stumbled upon a really cool case study, which I took this picture from in Kodiak Island. Um, Alaska, and they're completely powered 100% um, by renewable energy. They used to rely on shipments of diesel uh, coming in every, every couple of weeks and burning that diesel in big generators to power their entire town of about 10,000 people on this, you know, this large island. Instead, one day they decided to invest in wind energy, as you see here, and they put up a big battery bank, um, some flywheel energy storage, and now they can essentially power their entire town with wind, hydro, and battery storage. Um, so after that experience, I said, well, this is something I'm interested in working 
you know, in communities and remote areas and, you know, helping those that are on the front lines of, of climate change avoid these risks. And so I went to uh, Stanford for grad school um, where my first class was taught by the CTO and co-founder of Tesla, J.B. Strobel, who came back to teach a class after he, uh, his ideas from, uh, uh, for starting Tesla and becoming a co-founder in batteries actually was born out of this exact lab that I'm sitting in right now, where I'm in the renewable energy lab here at Stanford University. Um, this lab has been around for 40 years, so it's kind of this cool, uh, cool uh, historical place where a lot of these ideas were, were born out in sustainable design and building science and re more recently in the last you know, decade, um, Tesla. Um, so I take this class, I do a design project on how to power a different Alaska village with a, with a you know, big battery. And I remember on the poster presentation the last day, um, you know, JB Strobel comes, you know, walks up my poster, I'm really nervous. You're the Tesla co-founders coming up and you know, asking me about my project and what I'm passionate in, because um, he's always emphasized, you know, I'm coming back to Stanford to teach and inspire the new generation. So it was like, wow, this big head honcho who, you know, is pretty much on the phone with Elon Musk every day is, you know, taking time to talk to me and interested in what I'm passionate about. And so he asked me about being, you know, electrochemical redox, you know, reactions that my battery that I design. Now I'm totally nervous and blanking. Um, but I remember, I remember AP chemistry and I remember oil rig. I don't know if any of you still remember oil rig, but I remember oxidation involves loss and reduction involves gain. And, you know, I had a really good moment. I, you know, kind of, I think I, you know, got a good grade in that project based on just talking to them right there. So bottom line is remember those fundamentals because uh, they could be really important when you're talking to somebody really important uh, later on in life and you can't design a really cool technology without starting with the fundamentals. So that's my little brief story before I, you know, jump into the meat of my presentation. But yeah, any, any questions on that so far? Yeah, so uh, yeah, don't, don't forget little things like, or do you, do, you still, do you still teach that, Dr. C? Oh yeah, I have five sections of AP Chem this year, oh. Inclu including the remote kids in China. Yeah, more than oh. I, I have 60 kids. I've never had 60 before. So yeah, I'm definitely still teaching AP Chem. Oh my gosh, yeah. That, from those days in high school, that's what got me started interested in, um, in batteries. And that's for sure, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I'll hit on a little bit about myself. You're probably wondering who is this guy talking to you guys all on a, on a nice Thursday afternoon, at least here in the Bay Area. Um, talking about a little bit of my impression, what the problem is that we're trying to solve, the opportunity, because um, you know every good problem comes with an uh, amazing opportunity to develop new solutions, and specifically my experiences in building science and, and renewable energy systems. And so I'm a big I'm a big map guy. So I'll show you kind of you know my my little story via map. So I grew up um, in Lake Zurich, Illinois, about half hour west of, of LFA. Um, and it was actually what got me interested in these remote communities and trips and environmental justice and to you know, fight climate change was in my senior year in Eric Visser's, uh, Mr. Visser's class, um, you know, cool Spanish elective, which LFA is fantastic. This class, biochemistry, I mean, it, LF, there's no other high school I feel like that allows you to have so, many, so much flexibility and you know, ability to study you know, cool independent you know, subjects that you normally wouldn't in a normal high school atmosphere. So um, you guys are really lucky. I'm really happy I went to LFA. So I hope you guys are having as good of experience as I did. But we traveled to this remote uh, native Quechuan town for a couple of weeks, um, high up at you know, 13,000 feet in the Andes. And there we built you know, a little sewing center. Um, up there and you know discussing how to power them because they're pretty far off the, the grid and that kind of left a big impact on me is that you know being able to relate directly to the you know the issues at heart there we saw you know the glaciers that used to be you know flowing down close to town are you know, pretty much wiped out and that's threatening their water supply and that kind of hit me over the head for the first time um, in 2010 that you know, there's a lot of issues that are going to be caused by climate change. And many of us, you know, in Chicago or San Francisco aren't going to feel those effects firsthand, but there's a lot of people um, that will. And, you know, I wanted to dedicate some amount of my, my studies and my life to helping those, you know, up front um, who bear in the 
bearing the brunt of, of climate change and seeing if we can scale solutions to, to help everybody else who are, you know, eventually we're all gonna feel those impacts. So these are just kind of the canaries in the coal mine here. And then I went to undergrad in Brown University in Rhode Island. I came here to Stanford and, and from there, I've done a lot of other trips, which I'll get into. And, and now I work a lot in Alaska. And so I kind of had, I was thinking of, it was kind of fun putting this together, thinking about the different ways, my passion and my thoughts for fighting climate change and, and pursuing as, you know, as my studies in environmental sciences have shaped over the years. So I remember back in 2009, when I was applying for uh, colleges and writing my essays, uh, solar energy is really expensive. So I said, you know, I'm gonna go to college, I'm gonna help design new solar panels and I'm gonna bring those down um, in costs and develop new, you know, new ways of designing solar panels. And so actually in my sophomore year, we, uh, <clears throat> I took a really interesting elective. We designed a solar panel made out of um, uh, jam. So we ground up some blackberry jam, we put them into, um, to make a pigment, we put them between two um, transparent conducting oxide uh, electrodes, and we generated a small current. They were less than 1% efficient, but we did it, and it was a fun, fun experience. And within a few years, regular solar photovoltaics came down so much in price um, that new technology, while still research is still going on, we still need to advance new solar energy technology, but solar photovoltaics are for the most part right now, incredibly um, dirt cheap um, to the point where it's not as, not as interesting, at least to me as a problem. Um, so I started doing other design experiences. I, I pursued some National Science Foundation undergraduate research ex experiences, REUs. If you guys remember this when you're in college, look at the REU programs. It's great to get hands-on um, hands research. So I was working in designing new batteries and designing solar thermal systems there. Went to, um, I finished my mechanical engineering at a degree at Brown. And there I invented a, a compost system that you can stick under your sink as an incinerator and it collects all your you know, food waste, but instead of grinding them up and shipping them into the wastewater system um, and getting rid of that resource, I collected it, dried it and turned it into um, uh, a soil amendment that you can scatter on your house plants. So you're not tossing your food waste out in the garbage and you're treating what was a waste source as a potential resource. So kind of thinking about systems and that's where I started, you know, really thinking about um, how things are, you know, interactive as a cradle to cradle approach. Um, then I went to Alaska, wasn't sure what I wanted to do next. So I came to Stanford and we really got interested in batteries um, and doing electrochemistry research. Um, and there I started realizing, well, my colleagues and us that were coming out with new batteries, you know, they're not any good unless we can actually commercialize them and make a difference to fight climate change. You know, it's great to have a cool lab scale prototype, but um, I'm interested in deploying those out to these remote communities and getting to the point we can, you know, sell them. So I, I took a, a MBA program for scientists and that got me thinking a little bit more on how to scale. Um, I started a company on how to design renewable energy systems for remote communities. Um, I did that for a year that brought me to Alaska. Um, and then uh, I must have been I must have been born to be an academic because not many people start a company and then go back into academia. Well, that was what happened to me. The University of Alaska Fairbanks said this is a great um, this is a great venture. Um, we don't we see this more as a you know, potential research opportunity that we like to absorb. Um, and uh, would you like to do a PhD with us? And so I created a collaboration between Stanford and Alaska for my PhD. And now I'm looking at systems level design uh, solutions for food, energy, and water systems in remote Alaska communities for my dissertation. And uh, on the side, I'm, I'm a lecturer for energy efficient buildings and actually planning to uh, stick on next year and become a lecturer full time, um, you know, potentially as a professor going forward and potentially teaching that class that the CTO of uh, Tesla uh, brought back to Stanford. So that's enough about me. My point is there's so much, there's so many cool things out there um, to do. You know, just follow what you're really interested in. There's, I'll outline a few questions, you know, open spaces where I think we need more, more work in my opinion. Um, but 
there's so much good work out there. Don't worry about, you know, having somebody say, oh, well, we need, you know, better batteries. If you're not interested in batteries, you know, there's something else you can design. So just follow your passion and things will sort out in the end. And so I've, I've been able to do some really cool trips um, to emphasize these points, you know, working in inner city Providence, um, designing uh, new gardens for food deserts, all the way up to the most remote, you know, Arctic village in Northwest Alaska, where you're flying in at minus 40 degrees. Um, so I'll, I'll, sh I'll show some, you know, pictures uh, going forward of everything. But my point here is that I've seen, I've seen a lot of different places across the world. And it's fun to kind of look back in these memories when we can't travel during COVID and everything. It's a healthy dose of, of daydreaming about travel. But uh, point here is I've, I've seen the effects of, of climate change so far, and they're not pretty. Um, places in Alaska have warmed by, you know, five degrees Fahrenheit over the last, you know, 50 years versus the rest of the rest of the world's um, you know, maybe just say right around one degree Fahrenheit. Things are things are changing rapidly. It's not a question of you know if this is happening. It's just a matter of how how severe the effects are going to be. And in Alaska, um, you know, just sitting down with community elders and you know talking to them about how you know their son <clears throat> their son you know passed away by breaking through you know ice on you know, hunting trails that have been used for millennia um, during those time periods. It's, it's just, it's just really, it's really sad and hard to see, you know, I've seen people's homes fall into the ocean because now storms are coming off of uh, seas that are no longer frozen. And so when you have big winter storms coming off open water, that open water is buffeting shorelines and homes are falling in. And part of my part of my research group in Alaska is looking at how do you design new communities for these uh, places to relocate to, uh, which is a really tough tough question. Um, so things are things are things are tough when you have to see this you know every day and talk to people. But it just for, it provides further motivation, and sometimes you need a dose of reality to you know get back to work and, and hunker down. So this is this is going to happen all over the world. There's going to be more climate refugees um, everywhere we look. You know, see it in you know Bangladesh, um, India with rising rising sea levels, hurricanes in Puerto Rico. Um, I mean, you see it even in you know in Illinois. I follow the weather you know every day. What's going on in my parents' house? And you know, last few years going back for for the holidays, I mean, it's been 60 degrees on Christmas. I mean, this is just things are not normal. Um, and we know this, and it's only going to get it's only going to get worse. We're going to add two billion people to the plan in the next uh, thirty years. Um, we need large scale um, solutions. And after reading Drawdown, this is probably nothing new to you, you all. But I'm hoping to bring a little bit of insight from my connections, my network, and my mentors. Uh, so don't take my word for it. I've been very blessed to learn from some of the you know best and brightest in the industry. And I'm excited to kind of pass, you know, a few of those tidbits on to you today. Um, you know, some of the names I like to highlight, Amory Lovins is a huge mentor of mine from Rocky Mountain Institute. I encourage you to read anything um, on integrative design principles that he puts out. His uh, Natural Capitalism is an amazing book of his that's open, open source online. Um, at Stanford, I had the pleasure of being a, uh, a TA for Dave Danielson for two years. Um, who came out of the uh, Department of Energy to come and teach at Stanford and now manages Bill Gates's Breakthrough Energy Ventures and Mission Innovation. If you haven't um, heard of Breakthrough Energy Ventures, I encourage you to, to just Google their, their name. Bill Gates has dedicated billions of dollars to helping fund new initiatives and projects um, to fight climate change. And so I got a chance to learn from from Dave for multiple years of what he thinks are the most important, you know, technologies that are going to take to, to get us over the hump. Um, what's the most important, you know, uh, piece of white space to pursue. And then Bill Gates gave a, gave a lecture at Stanford uh, via Zoom a few weeks ago. So I'll make some of those advice and, and Bill Gates came out with a, a book, how to avoid a climate disaster. That's an, also a good one right up there with drawdown. Um, so I've been blessed. I mean, one of my points here is, there's some things you just can't learn in, in books that it takes um, interviewing people, just reaching out um, sometimes cold or sometimes through your, your network 
and just trying to get those answers um, from people in the industry. Um, and that's what, that's what I found out. Um, that's what you find out in grad school. So this is a slide that Dave Danielson shows um, that uh, Breakthrough Energy publicizes that currently, well, now we're at 51 uh, gigaton, um, gigatons or billion tons of carbon dioxide emitted um, annually. And we need to get down to 10 by 2050. I mean, this is a huge, this is a huge gap because at our current trend, you know, we're going up towards 80. Um, we not only are we going to have to stop emitting, we're going to have to start pulling that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you know, through um, afforestation, regenerative agriculture, soil management, um, et cetera. So this is a rapid, deep decarbonization. But you might say, okay, what, you know, what's a gigaton? You know, how, how am I, I'm trying to relate this to, you know, where remote communities where they're just trying to feed themselves and not fall through melting ice. Um, how do we start relating this to the average, you know, person? Well, that means, you know, we're gonna need several ventures that tackle, you know, half a gigaton scale of carbon, you know, at a time. And so this is like adding, you know, 250 gigawatts of wind and solar. So uh, Wyoming is adding um, a gigawatt of solar project, you know, this year. This is that's, you know, hundreds of acres of wind. So that's just one gigawatt, let alone 250. So a, a gigawatt power plant that's like one big uh, coal plant. So just to give you an idea of the scale um, of, you know, the problem, and we generate about, you know, we have got about a thousand, you know, power plants, you know, in the in the U.S., so it's going to take multiple Exxon Mobil's to size companies, you know, to break through this you know gap, and it's going to require a team um, team effort of you know working with private sector, public you know funding um, to get this done. And um, we know you know one and a half degree C probably reading drawdown. We know that energy is going to be increasing, and personally, the the issue of environmental justice and providing electricity to the billions of people who don't have it and they have a right to have it, um, no matter what, we have to make sure we provide that electricity as sustainably as possible because they have a right to generate electricity um, via coal. You know, they have the same argument. If you, we, we industrialized and we developed, why can't we do the same thing? Well, it's not fair for us to say, I, you know, I, I grew up in privilege, you know, in Illinois, I got to go to go grade high school. Why can't you do the same? Well, there's an opportunity to do all that um, while still developing a good system that doesn't have to pollute the planet. Um, and so I like to think of this in terms of triangles. Um, I love geometry, so I, I think of triangles a lot. But uh, you might have heard the three P's of sustainability here or the three E's, which are ecology, you know, equity, um, and economy. Um, but I, I like people, prosperity, and planet. And I highlight a picture from one of my one of my uh, research trips to Malaysia, to a, a remote community where we developed uh, we installed a solar array so that they could assist with their agriculture uh, agricultural production out there um, into this community, and so they didn't have to bring in um, diesel fuel because um, they had several diesel generators. But it's uh, it's a several hour drive from the nearest town. Then you have to get on a boat. Um, and a boat for you know 20 miles for an hour. And then you have to hike up a mile into this, this town. So it's really hard to do that, to bring diesel fuel there and do that regularly. Um, just take somebody doing that constantly to actually get fuel. But we have sun shining you know, freely on the site at all times. Doesn't it make sense to just do one of those trips, get a solar panel in, and now you have free electricity for you know, at least the next 25 years. Um, so I installed a solar array there. And initially I thought, oh, this is gonna be easy. It's just gonna be you know, doing uh, you know, my normal solar installs, which I like doing around the Bay Area as a volunteer. Um, but that's just the technology aspect. You need to think about you know, how can we make this you know, economically feasible and scalable? How can we develop you know, organizational business structures that can fund themselves so we're not relying on grants um, for me to go out to these places, we can create organizations that, that fund themselves to do this at scale and make sure that we're integrating and meeting the needs of the people first, since we're trying to provide services 
um, you know, to a person. So this required working with the community leaders, um, sitting down, learning about, you know, their culture, how do we best integrate, you know, technology into that. Um, and that was, that was one of my first doses of, of reality in grad school that it's, I, even as an engineer, I can't just, we can't just design technology to get us out of this, this problem. We actually have to get this implemented in the world to make a difference and getting this implemented in the world means engaging with, with real people, understanding where people are coming from and their different cultures. So whereas in the US, I can you know, go to a solar, I can go to a, a residential home, you know, sign them up for solar, go on the roof, install it in a day versus in, in Malaysia, that means you know, sitting down you know, getting to know the community, having them trust me, you know, having tea for multiple days, you know, on end and thinking outside the box before I, before, you know, I go in and say, this is what I want to do, try to listen from them what they need first. And so I think about this in my everyday research and building science as the principle of, we're trying to heat a person and not a building. So you think about the end use of what we're trying to do. You know, if you want um, cold drinks on a hot day, you store that energy in ice. Um, you don't necessarily have to, you know, use a solar panel to generate electricity and store that electricity in a battery to then power a fridge. We can just directly um, store that energy in ice. And there's actually technologies out being developed um, in a lab next door about how to use panels that are evaporative coolers to radiate uh, energy out into the night sky, even during the middle of the day to cool down um, materials without even needing to use electricity. So really cool uh, technologies that if you think fundamentally about the issue, they wouldn't have thought about, oh, let's generate you know, a panel to, you know, to cool some you know, different thing. They were just thinking about what needs to be done first. We need to provide this cooling. Let's break out of the mold of thinking we need a solar panel on a battery, which is the, you know, the typical um, you know, ideas that we like to you know, pitch uh, for decentralized renewable energy systems in remote communities, but we can provide these services in, in different ways. Um, and so I, I also uh, wanted to highlight a picture here from you know, one of a picture I took in, in Thailand it shows they're thinking about it you know, the same way that we did. You know, we need to you know, big these, build these big power plants, put lines up, uh, electric lines, you know, wire them to you know, every single home. Um, but instead, if we take a step back and can we do this a little bit differently, just like you're well familiar with the analogy in, in Africa of, of bypassing landline telephones, everybody now has a cell phone. Why can't we do the same thing with electricity? Why can we build decentralized modular uh, energy solutions instead of relying on the centralized grid and distributing electricity via transmission and distribution? And so here I want to just highlight, you know, talking, uh, talking a lot here about, you know, my passion story, but, you know, for you guys, what are the, you know, the most interesting things that, you know, potentially stand out? So I put, I put a list together here um, from my experiences in my classes of some of the big opportunities in white space um, that we need, we need help with. These are ongoing open-ended questions that nobody's solved. These are the questions that are going to be answered by the next generation, by, by you all. Um, and uh, I can go into detail on any of these, you know, in, in questions and discussions, and I'll, I'm going to leave um, several minutes at the end to, you know, for questions um, and discussion at the end. And I have a whole list and bullet points on, on uh, different um, subtopics within this. Personally, I'm really interested in long duration uh, grid energy storage. Um, the refrigerator and cold storage revolutionized society in the early 1900s. Before then, you relied on the milk, you know, milk person to deliver a, a gallon of milk to your door every day, and you drank it, you know, pretty much that same day because you couldn't store it. Well, that's how we use electricity today. You know, every electron that's generated has to be consumed right away. There's very limited energy storage. I talk a lot about batteries, but there's still not that many batteries overall on the grid. Most of our energy storage today is in pumped hydro, we pump water, we use electricity to pump water up um, to a higher elevation and we use uh, potential energy to let it run down and, and turn a, a turbine to generate electricity. That's most of the way things are, are done um, today, but we kind of ran out of spaces to do that. There's limited, you know, big hills um, to put that on. Um, and, you know, grow up in the Midwest, there's not many hills at all. So we're kind of 
limited in that um, respect. Um, I'm really passionate about food and agricultural systems. Um, food waste has always been a big passion of mine. Um, I don't know, do they still, um, are there still prefects um, at LFA? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I was I was a prefect in in 2009 2010, and I self anointed myself as the food waste prefect. It was kind of silly, but I I try to dedicate a lot of my initiatives to something I was passionate in, um, and uh, I started you know helping out with measuring you know food waste and everything, and talking to people about it. So you know again, just follow something you're passionate about, and um, it makes it makes life a lot more fun. You know, I teach building science here at Stanford, and I'm excited to come to work every day and engage with students. Um, because this is what I like to do. And I realized that there's, there's, I mean, my research can go a long way. I can deploy solutions to other communities, but really what's going to scale is if I tell, I tell, you know, 60 students a year, you know, the size of my class, they start to emphasize building science principles and, and retrofitting their homes with not natural gas furnaces, but, you know, electric heat pumps running off solar, you know, they tell their parents, you know, their friends and family tell each other. I mean, this starts to scale. And really, <clears throat> given I'm an academic now, I think you know education and, and teaching is is definitely one of the scalable uh, components that doesn't get enough credit um, in the fight against climate change, inspiring um, the next generation. Which is why I'm excited to talk to you and um, might be talking a little faster than I normally would in a normal conversation because I'm really energized to talk about these things. <laughs> Whew. So. Uh, Another one of my my you know, recommendations is, is going to be an interdisciplinary solution. So you know even if you're not um, you know if you, if you're you know taking biochemistry and you love science but you don't think you're going to be a you know chemist going forward, there's a lot of other um, you know issues that you can help with you know uh, you know chemistry solutions like being a, being a you know somebody in government who helps you know convert to develop policies to actually get you know, businesses to, you know, actually use the, you know, bioplastics and new um, technology that's, you know, it's coming out. Um, you know, here, you know, at Stanford, we had, um, you know, institutional mandates for campus-wide composting. And once the institution says that, there's going to be, you know, companies that come and fill in the gap and provide us with compostable uh, food ware. So, you know, when I go to the dining hall here, most of it's in compostable packaging, so I don't feel as, as bad. Um, about uh, composting uh, uh, or using single single plastic uh, containers, and so one of one of my favorite um, examples, and uh, from my Stanford Energy Ventures class, um, I helped mentor a lot of companies that are now there's about you know 20 companies currently um, tackling these uh, areas of of white space, and they've raised you know over 50 million dollars. Some of those from from Bill Gates. Um, and I really enjoyed mentoring and, and teaching students how to do so, um, even though I, I helped start a company and my heart was ultimately in mentorship. So I came back and I did a PhD and helped this company um, get going. And now he's, um, the founding team is some of my closest friends, but I wanna highlight this because I remember in AP Chemistry, we talked about a lot about the Haber-Bosch process which is arguably one of the biggest, you know, in, uh, you know, scientific breakthroughs of the 20th century, because without it, you know, we probably couldn't sustain this many people on the planet, it allowed us to create synthetic fertilizers. Um, well, now the new problem is how do we develop more and more fertilizers to, to satisfy an extra couple of billion people? Um, well, this, uh, this company used the, the fundamental processes of electrochemistry to develop a technology that uses sunlight, um, and solar energy to um, synthesize nitrogen-based fertilizers, um, essentially creating a miniature lightning type reaction to um, split nitrogen. Um, I can go into more detail this later on offline, but wanted to spend in the last uh, few minutes a little bit um, more time talking about something that I'm a little bit um, uh, more knowledgeable in, at least during my PhD in the last few years and that's uh, buildings and, and renewable energy systems. So buildings are gonna be a big component in, in the fight against climate change. You know, as we get more people on the planet, the developing world is gonna to continue to develop. They're gonna create more buildings. Um, so we're gonna need energy efficient, zero net energy um, buildings that not only use less energy, but are powered by renewables and actually help clean the environment and are uh, net detractors. And so I 
formulated my triangle a little bit differently in terms of focusing on efficiency, electrifying, and then powering that everything else with, with renewables. And I, I thought again to throw in a little bit of chemistry in here because buildings use a lot of, of concrete um, and cement is the binding agent within in concrete and it's very greenhouse gas intensive to produce as you see here on the, the equation here it needs a lot of heat um, you know on limestone and electricity um, to produce and this is um, a topic that there is really no solution to right now you know we can we can change most of our electricity generation to you know solar and wind if we have enough batteries and and grid scale management to make sure that we're using electricity when it's being produced by renewables but right now we don't have any solutions to you know replace a good chunk of greenhouse gas emissions and that's you know cement um, and steel um, production in our energy ventures you know class one staff Stafford, there are there are companies out there have started to develop new new technology, but it's really hard to displace, display something as cheap and as widely used as concrete. It's really hard to tell a building owner, hey, try my try out my new formulation for concrete um, when they're like, well, my my building might might fail. Why am I going to take this risk? Um, you know, even if I'm you know environmentally friendly, I still need I have an obligation to my clients to have a structurally sound building. So we need to address all these concepts when we're thinking about um, you know, fighting climate change, the technology, not just the technology, but uh, engaging with policy and making our technologies cheap enough to be adopted economically. And so um, <clears throat> specifically, I've targeted the problem of distributed renewable energy uh, deployment in remote communities um, using microgrids in my research. And typically everybody's focused on, you know, providing supply first in the form of diesel generation or replacing some of that with renewables and then focusing on efficiency. But my research is, can we focus on efficiency and using that electricity um, when it's available first before we deploy all those diesel generators? Because if we focus on efficiency first, we might not need to install as big of a diesel generator and that's gonna help pay for the bottom line of my efficiency projects because now you don't have to buy a new big diesel generator um, and all those little you know, efficiency upgrades are gonna ma manifest themselves and not having to install a big um, system up front. Um, and as concrete comes into play here in my research, there's actually this uh, right over my right hand shoulder, there's a big concrete block underneath a, a heat pump here um, where we do measurements on shining light into a concrete using passive solar, free sunlight to heat up that concrete and that concrete acts as a, a nice block of thermal storage. So then it provides heat at a different scale. And so we're detaching the supply and the demand. So now we can heat up um, our concrete when we have excess renewable energy, but that energy is being stored as heat for later on at night when we don't have that energy available. And we're doing this very cheaply using concrete directly because that's what we need is heat versus converting that electricity into a battery and then dissipating battery energy as heat. Um, so just thinking a little bit um, outside of the box and at a systems level. Um, and so this is a little complex um, uh, tidbit out of, my, out of my research, looking at different you know, energy sources, energy storage systems, and then controlling different loads to be run when um, we need to, to use them. And so one case study I thought I'd highlight from a recent paper that I published is how can we provide food in these remote communities um, to grow? It's really hard to ship in um, produce since the middle of, uh, of nowhere, Alaska, and now they can't hunt and fish on the sea ice as much. So now they're becoming more dependent on imported food. Um, so now I'm studying, can we deploy container farms in these communities? But these container farms are really energy intensive because now there's no sunlight in the middle of winter and we have to provide all that sunlight with um, electricity. Um, but can we uh, manage these systems so that they um, use solar, they use solar energy to grow crops so we can potentially manage and, and uh, change how their energy is being used. So can we heat up this system when we have a lot of solar available and let it you know, coast down and, and temperature and cool off when we don't have as much available or pump and treat water uh, when we have energy um, and store that energy um, as clean water or heat for when we do need it. Um, and then this is one of my, my last slides and a little fun tidbits from monitoring um, carbon dioxide in these container farms. I thought, well, this is connected into 
you know, how do we use plants to take carbon dioxide out of the air? And you're probably familiar with the fact that carbon dioxide is increasing over time, but we have so many trees in the Northern hemisphere compared to the Southern hemisphere where there's not as much land that um, the carbon dioxide levels actually decrease during Northern hemisphere summer. And then one of my experience, experiments here in the lab is how to use uh, carbon dioxide as a tracer gas to see how leaky uh, buildings are so they don't lose as much heat. Um, and we use we design our solutions there via you know, human uh, respiration. So finally, this is my last slide, saving just a few minutes for, for questions. Um, things I thought I'd, when I was making this presentation of what I would tell my um, younger self and what I teach now in my class is, um, you might have you know, heard Dr. C you know, harp on units and significant figures. It is really critical to your success in the rest of education. Just if you just follow your units and present in a reasonable amount of significant figures, it actually makes a big, big difference in whether you're going to you know pass that exam or not. So just uh, Dr. C didn't say, tell me to say that, but it's important. Um, but again, uh, I like to step out in nature when I get stressed and think about what we're trying to protect. We're trying to protect you know you know the woods and places I'm you know was really excited about to you know, grow up in. So don't forget to take some time and appreciate you know the national parks and and nature and have an idea of what we're trying to, to save here. Um, so don't stress out too much about your college apps. It'll work out um, in the end, as long as you're focused on just learning, following your passion, think about you know, things as a system, not just you know, detached parts. Um, and finally, once you're you know, old enough, you know, get out, vote, express yourself politically, decide you know, the products you wanna buy and, and you know, vote with your dollar potentially and study the things that you think are gonna make the big, most difference. Um, so with that, I'll leave uh, at least a couple minutes for question. I'm, I'm happy to stay on you know, after time and um, I'll send these slides out to Dr. C along with my email in case you wanna chat or if any of you um, wind up coming to Stanford, I can more than happy to sit down and plan your, your uh, classes around climate change. So with that, thanks for listening everybody. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Wow. 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 I'm impressed. Okay. I'm going to let you students ask questions first before I jump in. I think Jake had to leave early for a doctor's appointment, but I think everybody else is here. Go ahead. Anybody? Come on. Don't be shy. Uh, I was going to ask, do you have a, like an idea of where you're going with, with these projects? Like, do you have a long-term goal that you and your team are shooting towards? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's always, scalability is always on my mind. So I'm, I'm part of a National Science Foundation research grant in Alaska, where we're working with select communities. And our plan is to implement the plans that we've learned in the rest of the 200 communities in Alaska and scale those throughout the Canadian Arctic, um, through Siberia um, and Scandinavia as well. So the solutions for my dissertation are actually going to be implemented into these, these communities. So I'm actually going this summer into the, into the Yukon doing research in, in terms of uh, implementing this in a test uh, community and going forward. I've worked in, oh, I didn't even talk about my project in, in China. Um, uh, I'm also planning to, I've worked with a, a Chinese conference to teach students building science principles and bring these back to their, their communities. So offline, I'd love to hear about your experience teaching in China as well, Dr. C. Um, but yeah, it's all, that's a great point. It's all about scalability and, and making sure that what you're doing is gonna get implemented by somebody else. And eventually they're gonna implement that and teach somebody else about it too. Mm -hmm. This is probably not as good as a question as Calvin, but what made you like focus on Alaska and like more northern um, areas rather than like the like southern areas? <laughs> yeah, so that's a fun question. I'm I'm a very uh, cold blooded uh, person. I always wore shorts. Um, if there wasn't a dress code, I wear shorts year round at LFA, and my my legs were always hot in class from wearing long pants. Um, and I love skiing and snow. I actually commuted to class in Rhode Island via cross country ski multiple times. So I just, I'm a, I'm a snow nerd. Um, and so mm -hmm. I love, I love being out in, in Alaska, um, in winter. Um, plus you can probably tell my face is getting pretty warm, just 
teaching. So in general, I get warm really easily, which is why I'm so adamant about fighting climate change because a few degrees warmer means a lot less snow and a lot higher temperatures. And I actually have, to, I leave California in the summers to work up in Alaska, partly because of the wildfire smokes and how hot I get. So there's just some personal incentive there too, um, for why I get out. Wow. Speaking of Alaska, I have a question about, you said that the, um, the Kodiak Island, they use turbines. And what was your thought about what happened in Texas when all the turbines weren't working and they're like, oh, see, this is why renewables can't work. And obviously there's other places in the country in the world that use wind turbines, even in cold weather. And obviously you just got done telling us that 100% of their renewable, they're 100% renewable in Alaska. So is it a matter of just that they didn't winterize or is it more to it? That's a great, great question. I've been following the Texas dilemma a lot and teaching my students and building some science about it. It's totally overblown politically. Um, a lot of conservatives have been attacking wind turbines for no good reason. The, the, I mean, yes, the, some of the wind turbines failed because they weren't de-iced um, properly, but that was only about 10% of the problem. The big problem in Texas was that none of the natural gas infrastructure was properly we weatherized. And that's because a lot of the natural gas plants resisted regulation and they had a lot of uh, buddies in the government that didn't enforce that regulation on them and came back to, to bite them that they didn't have properly insulated um, plants. So weatherizing wind turbines, you know, I'm sure they're going to do that coming up. It's relatively easy. Um, in Alaska, they've developed um, de-icing systems that are relatively common, and these communities are powered throughout the winter by a wind energy when storms are coming in at hundreds of miles, you know, over 100 miles an hour, it's minus 40 degrees, the light's still on, this is a solved problem. Texas just mm -hmm. doesn't want to adopt the technology, you know, and there. You know, and, they, yeah. 10 years ago, they also had a similar problem. And the people said, okay, here's the recommendation. So you just said, oh, they're probably gonna start winterizing, but I don't know, they're, they're stubborn. Okay, one more quick question um, on the same point. You know, how do we convince you know, people in Congress and the average person not to politicize it so much and just to talk about this as a matter of you know, humanity and helping humans. It is, it's not about left and right and red and blue. It's about, these are the things that help us all. And, and you know, they always say, oh, this is gonna be a job killer. But in fact, you, you had said, and I know that other, Jake has said this in our class, you know, these are, look at it as an opportunity, not mm -hmm. as, you know, a job killer. So how, what, what's the trick, what's the secret sauce to get the, uh, you know, the, the politicians to be on our side? I think it goes back to just looking at the fundamentals of, of science um, and pursuing basic research. Um, and that's, and then at the end of the day, you find out what's going to be the most economic and uh, prevalent solution. Um, you know, solar and wind energy is now cheaper than um, coal, definitely cheaper than coal and on par with natural gas. Um, and that's just looking at basic dollars and cents. So when people, when people tell me, you know, oh, you just, you know, you just like solar because you're, you know, you're a liberal. No, I say it's a, it's a proven, it's a better technology and it's cheaper. It's resilient. So when, um, you know, a hurricane comes through Puerto Rico, that solar panel will still be there, even though, you know, transmission lines from, you know, big central power plants are gone. These are just better solutions. It's not about, um, you know, political this or that. Um, and frankly, this is just the way things are, are going through in the country, in the world. You know, as we have more natural disasters, we need resilient systems. And it just turns out that solar and wind are much more resilient because they're distributed and they don't rely on a, you know, central um, grid infrastructure, they're not a big power plant that relies on big transmission lines to, to be distributed everywhere. So this is just the, the way things are going. I read, you know, study uh, article this morning from Wyoming. It's just like, they, they know coal is, is going away. It's hard. Um, but that's the jobs are coming in and win. This is just where things are going, not because some, you know, democratic president's telling them it has to be, it's because the economy is dictating that to us. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And there's a messaging issue too, probably. So the renewable people maybe don't re message it well enough. But anyway, go yeah. ahead. What else do we have, students? Katie, Nemo, anybody else? I have Nemo. to go, but I just wanted to say thank you for talking to us. It was good. Thank you. Nemo, really quickly, in Taiwan, what, what's the most common energy source? 
What do, what do people mostly use in Taiwan? Do you know where mostly energy comes from? Um, I'm not sure actually. Okay, but, I didn't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a good amount of hydro, I think. There, I mean, the the mountains in, in Taiwan are just so. Yeah, steep. there are mountains in Taiwan. Yeah. Okay, how about Anya? In do you know in in Russia? I think like fuels, it's but what? not solar energy. Oh, okay, more solar, but but okay. No, I mean not solar energy, more not, fuels. Oh, just the. Petroleum, some type yeah. of petroleum. Okay. Yeah, so they're still. All right, well, it's going to take a while, I guess, huh? Before we all get. Or maybe, you know what I used to say? I don't know if I ever said this in your class, Dan, but um, necessity is the mother of all invention. Yes. And when we get to the, when we get to the point where we're desperate and ah, everything's going crazy, then we'll start coming up with ideas and we might be on board. But the, the problem that what I always say is, unfortunately, every day that we put it off, it becomes more expensive. We say it's expensive now, yeah. but the same thing we would try to do a year from now is going to be, you know, a hundred bucks more per gigawatt or per whatever, you know, I mean, everything's going to just keep increasing in cost unless we can get something going and you know bring some costs down or make some major discovery i mean that would be incredible if we could have like a great discovery where all of a sudden oh my gosh this is 100 percent energy storage in this battery fusion yeah fusion is always that hope potentially but uh, yeah cold fusion wouldn't that be something back in the 80s with ponds and Fleischmann, they said oh yeah we can do this electrochemically and then of course nobody could really repeat that experiment reliably so oh yeah yeah a problem so huh? <laughs> yeah anybody COVID, else? Yeah. oh i feel i feel like covid teaches a lot of lessons too is like yeah this is this is you know it's hard and expensive to do this right away but climate change is kind of like covid over time you know we don't see that you know end goal of how hard it's going to be but you know arguably this is going to is going to happen it's going to take you know drastic measures and if the longer we put it off you know we could have solved this back in the last spring but now it just got harder and harder and harder the more we put it off so i mean a good i think it's a good analogy Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. exactly exactly anybody else everybody's good all right well i can't thank you enough for visiting with us um zoom records this so i can i mean the the students will have the recording they want to go back and look if it's it's okay i'm going to share it with a couple of other people that i think wanted to learn about what you're talking about if that's okay with you yeah yeah i was gonna reach out to mr shaughnessy and the and the vons to see if they're around so feel free to to share with them if um are the are the jones mr and mr jones still around they no they moved they actually live in texas austin texas oh, okay. oh, mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah they're there now they were in connecticut for a couple of years and then they went to texas and i think they feel like that's their home now so so that's good. But yeah, yeah, the Vons are still there, the Tennysons, the Freemans, the oh. kind of the, you know, Shaughnessy and, and who else would you know? Mr. Pasca. Oh, I need to, yeah, he's on. I, I never even told him that. I mean, that was my dream as a, in your shoes right now, it was to go to Stanford was my number one choice um, uh, under, in the undergrad. I'm actually really happy I went to, to Brown it was the perfect fit. And then now, you know, things work out. Now right. I'm here at Stanford and for the long run. So that's that's another good you know tidbit for you is like you know if you if you get bummed out with your first choice everything happens for a reason ends up in the end and college applications I feel like right now it's it's a matter of luck I think Stanford's under three percent acceptance right now so it just depends on how vocal your you know the college counselor who reads your application here at Stanford is in fighting for you so don't get too hard on yourself on college apps and just follow what you love and like to do as opposed to patting your resume. I, I just needed to emphasize that, that again. All right. Well, thank you. Anybody else? Last chance. Well, you can always reach out, like yeah, you said. I'll send, yeah, I'll send the slides and I'll send you, um, and you feel free to pass along my email. Great. Thanks okay. so much for having me, Dr. Sue. Right. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful hearing for you. Thank you.